Free agent Des Bryant was hanging out with Jerry Jones. There are troubled waters with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Le'Veon Bell is still a holdout. Could Spencer Dinwiddie be dealt to the Phoenix Suns? Does tennis still have a diversity problem? And Josh Gordon and the Cleveland Browns have parted ways. All that and more on What's the 401 Sports coming right up. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, it's great to see you. You too, Keisha. And all of our friends out there. So we're just going to get started and head to the gridiron. The NFL season is underway and Des Bryant is still without a football home. Taking a break from Twitter and a cameo on Hard Knocks, Des Bryant went to the Jay-Z and Beyonce concert where he was seen in the same box as Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones. Now, Jerry Jones told radio station 105.3 The Fan that he and Brian did not talk football at all. Now, Mike, I ask you, do you think there's a possibility that Des Bryant could re-sign with the Cowboys? I don't think so. And I know that Stephen Jones has issued a statement that there could be an opening out there where they would possibly bring Des, Des Bryant in. But, but two things. One is, number one, I, I just feel like that with Dak Prescott and where he is right now, uh, I think that it's best for this team to kind of move forward, get some younger guys in there at their wide receivers. And I just don't see them bringing Des Bryant back in. And, you know, Keisha, the other thing is, is, is that Des Bryant, over the course of the offseason, he really lit into the Dallas Cowboys, specifically his teammates. Um, and I think that that's really just sort of created this big divide where I can't see them going after Des Bryant. As far as where Des is most likely to wind up, especially with, I'm sure we'll get into Josh Gordon later on, I could see the Cleveland Browns as a possibility. And then there could be some injuries over the next few weeks where teams that are playoff contenders could possibly be looking at a guy like Des Bryant to come fill a void that they need. But at this moment, you know, I certainly don't see the Dallas Cowboys opening their arms again to Des Bryant. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the professional relationship between the Cowboys and Des Bryant is over. They've clearly tried to move on, or clearly looking to move on. And, you know, most of the times it's not a good idea to go back to your ex. There's a reason why you broke up in the first place. And unless Des has gotten younger and healthier over the the past few months, there's no real need for him to come back. And you touched a, a little bit on it about the locker room. What would the locker room be like if Des were to return? He's called uh, linebacker Sean Lee a snake. Uh, there was, Stephen Jones said that Des Bryant, along with Jason Witten, was in Dak Prescott's ear. And, you know, the Cowboys really need as minimal distractions for Dak Prescott as possible because they're looking to rebound off of last year's performance. But the prof the personal relationship between at least Jerry Jones and Des Bryant will continue. I, I think that uh, Jerry Jones has gone on record in saying that he really, uh, you know, has, he cares for Des Bryant. And I think for him, him being Jerry Jones, I don't think that, I think the move to release him was more business than personal. So I can see, you know, maybe them chilling in the box at another concert or, you know, grabbing a beer or lunch, whatever Jerry Jones you know, likes to do. So I can see that happening. Yeah. Well, Keisha, we move on to the NBA. And, you know, this has been a story that we've been covering for some time now because it won't go away. And what it is is that the NBA season, with it about to start right now, uh, it seems like we're picking up where we left off as far as Jimmy Butler is concerned. Word has it that Butler is expected to meet with the Timberwolves right around today, actually, and he's going to discuss his future with the team. Specifically, it's rumored that Butler is not happy with Carl Anthony Towns and Andrew Wiggins. The chemistry is just not fitting properly with those three players. Now, speculation is that some of Butler's dream teams for next season would be the Lakers, the Celtics, and possibly the New York Knicks. Now, to throw more fuel to the fire, Timberwolves owner Glenn Taylor is having second thoughts about giving head coach Tom Thibodeau full basketball operations uh, that responsibility. Now, Keisha, I ask you, could the T-Wolves, who are not, a, could, they're not a top five team in the West, could this hurt Tom Thibodeau and could he not survive this fallout? Well, there's a lot to dissect here with the Minnesota Timberwolves. And um, Jimmy Butler has gone on record saying that he didn't have a meeting with uh, the Timberwolves management. So who knows who's telling the truth. But from his mouth, he said he didn't have a meeting and that you shouldn't listen to the Internet. However, there is a serious problem. And for Tom Thibodeau, the, the 
history, recent history shows that coaches are not successful when they have coaching responsibilities and being head of basketball operations. Doc Rivers from the LA Clippers, he was relieved of his uh title of basketball operations. Stan Van Gundy, the former Detroit Pistons head coach, was also in charge of basketball operations and he let he was let go after a pretty, well, subpar tenure with the Pistons. So it's really hard to be successful at one of those positions, much less both. So Tibbs has already got his hands full in that regard. Um and and just in terms of just being a coach, he's got a problem. He's got one of his best stars in Jimmy Butler ready to walk out. Why? Because he does not really care for the other two superstars that are on his team or the ones that are projected to be his superstars, which are Andrew Wiggins and Carl Anthony Towns. Now, Wiggins and Towns' performances have been a little um, below expectations, and Thibodeau hasn't really gotten the best out of them yet, and I don't know if he knows how to because Tom Thibodeau, his defensive mind is what he's really known for and that's what his trademark is. But then he's got problems on that side because in the past two years since he's been at the helm, the Timberwolves defensive rating, they've been at the bottom half of the league. So he hasn't, that's not going right either. Now, you know, when you go back to now, he is also head of basketball operations and in responsible for building a roster it seems like he's kind of going back to his glory days of chicago with some of the acquisitions that he has he has Todd gibson Todd gibson Derek rose and now i think it's official that lu all dang is going to be on the roster so i mean he's going backwards and older and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best fit to get this team where they need to be. Um, so Tibbs is in, in some some trouble. His seat is very warm. And if there's not significant improvement this season, I think that he's either going to be out or he's just going to be relieved of his basketball operations duties. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, it's almost like taking on two full-time jobs, right? You're the head coach of the team, and then also you have to focus on scouting. And a lot of it is delegating, right? But at the same time, it seems like this is something for Tom Thibodeau that it's just it seems like he's in a little bit over his head. Not to mention, you pointed out Doc Rivers, who had this sort of dual job, right, with the L.A. Clippers. Doc Rivers had proven himself with the Boston Celtics by going ahead and winning a championship. And this is no knock on Tom Thibodeau, who is a great, great head coach, but he hasn't necessarily won a championship. I agree with you. The pressure is absolutely on. This Jimmy Butler thing is something that they need to get solved immediately. They can't have this festering come training camp. And I think as far as Andrew Wiggins and Carl Anthony Towns are concerned, I think what the Timberwolves need to do is they need to come up with some type of solution to make this all work. As far as Jimmy Butler is concerned, I think that there's two things that had to be sticking out for him. One is obviously, right, he wants to get paid. There's no question about that. And this is a guy that had a very good season production-wise last season. And then at the same time, here's a guy, what, he's in his late 20s now. So he's still young, and he's still in the prime of his career. But the clock is always ticking. And I think it had got with a guy like Jimmy Butler, who's been on some very good Chicago Bull teams, and he was on a Minnesota Timberwolves team that actually did make the playoffs. But at the same time, with the way I see it, here's a guy that also, he wants to probably have a chance to compete for a title. So I I think that that's something that's also got to be in his mind. And he wants to be in the best situation to to make that absolutely that dream reality. And you know, for all that the the hype that Minnesota has, it just hasn't left up lived up to it. So maybe it's time for Jimmy to hit the road. Or I mean, Wiggins is not going anywhere because they just signed him to that long term extension. So he's going to be the only piece that stays if this team completely blows up. Right. So we're going to go back to the gridiron, and there's another problem with a star, and this is Le'Veon Bell, the running back for the Pittsburgh Steelers, who is still holding out because a long-term contract was not signed during the offseason with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, Le'Veon has been really upset by the bad-mouthing of the, of, um, by his, some of his teammates and just how everything has gone as a whole in terms of his relationship with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And now, Mike, it looks like Le'Veon can be a holdout until week 10, maybe out 
the whole season. What do you think about Le'Veon Bell, and when do you think he will return to the Pittsburgh Steelers in I, uniform? Right. <laughs> I think at some point, it, it look, the, number one is that, and we can people can fault Le'Veon Bell, but at the same time, I you really I can't criticize a, a prof, an NFL running back, right, where the life expectancy of an NFL running back is shorter than any other position in all, all professional sports. Now that's not a proven fact, but it's pretty sh- pretty clear that it's when you're a running back, your chances to get paid are not that are, are pretty slim. Now for Le'Veon Bell, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know I don't fault him necessarily here for for you know uh, for not showing up to the, for the Steelers. I can fault him though. For for not, you know, on Sunday when his team is playing against the Kansas City Chiefs and he's out there jet skiing in Miami. <laughs> Um, but this is on the Steelers organization. I've seen a lot of blame being tossed at Mike Tomlin. I don't think it's necessarily his fault. He's not the one that's organizing these contract negotiations. The Steelers organization completely dropped the ball here. The best solution is to just come up with some type of game plan where, you know, just get the guy in uniform, pay him the money. He deserves it. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity where you can get a dynamic player like this. And at the same time, there's a lot of things going on in that locker room uh, that are just, when, you know, they're not where they need to be. I think inevitably what will happen is probably by week seven, week eight, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the pressure is going to start getting on them and they're going to have to find a way to get Le'Veon Bell back in uniform. Yeah, I was really surprised that a long-term deal wasn't reached during the offseason because of the production that they got from Le'Veon Bell. And when, as time passed, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, why are you being stingy? Why are you not... Um, paying this man his money but then as this the off season continue and now we're into the regular season it's becoming very clear that it, there's more than football involved it's not just a matter of paying him what he's worth i think that f- perhaps the organization thinks that he is detrimental to the locker room and you can see how the his teammates have bad mouthed him to the press which you don't really happen when when there's always this I don't know if it's an unwritten rule or a spoken rule amongst players that you don't speak about another player when they're trying to get their money. You are, you know, you, you allow your that person to get the money because football players, their like their career, life expectancy <laughs> is very short. So you get you capitalize on what you can when you can. And we saw in publicly that the, his teammates spoke out against him. So that let me know that there's really something beyond the surface, and that maybe that is why the Pittsburgh Steelers did not want to reach a long-term deal with him. As far as where we might see him, I can see him coming back maybe week 10 because he has, Le'Veon has to report by week 10 in order to be able to sign, I think, with another team. So he's going he's gonna to be back by week 10 because it's going to be to his detriment to sit out the entire season and then expect another team to sign him to a big long-term contract. So he has to do it for himself. Now, I don't know what kind of playing time he's going to get when he decides if, because we're saying that he is going, we just don't know. But if he decides to return, we don't know what kind of playing time he's going to get, especially if the current running back, starting running back, James Conner, is performing the way he has so far. You know, it's a small sample size. We're, you know, about two weeks in. It's a small sample size, but he's really stepped up to the plate and performed excellently. So we'll see, you know, how Le'Veon gets back into game form and what what production he's going to get because this is basically an audition for him um, in terms of next season because there's no way that I see this, either side, the Steelers or Le'Veon Belt, wanting to continue this relationship. Absolutely. Mike, I have a couple quick questions for you. Larry Nance Jr. says that the Lakers could get to the finals because of LeBron James. What do you think about that? With the stacked Golden State Warriors lineup and with the way that the Houston Rockets played last season, I don't see it. I don't think that the Lakers are going to make a push to the NBA Finals. I mean, it should be interesting. And LeBron, we trust. We've seen LeBron, you know, carry a limping Cavaliers team to the final. And I think even won that they won that year yeah. against the Golden State Warriors. So we'll see. It's going to be tough. And my second question to you is... 
Uh, shout out to the Seattle Storm. They won the WNBA championship this season. And just like last year, this year's champions did not receive an invitation to visit the White House, nor did they expect one. Mike, do you think that the hockey champ champions will be the only ones to receive an invitation to the White House as long as Donald Trump is in office? Interesting enough with baseball, right? The Houston Astros won the World Series last season, and they did show up at the White House to meet Donald Trump. However, one thing that's interesting is this season, the Red Sox are certainly a contender to go ahead and win the World Series. Recently, Alex Cora, their manager, who is a Puerto Rico native, was not happy at all with some of the uh, comments that Donald Trump recently made uh, regarding the hurricane numbers down in Puerto Rico, which happened last year. I could see a team like the Red Sox, uh, and I hope it doesn't happen if they were to win the World Series because I'm a Yankee <laughs> fan. But I could see, you know, in other words, I'm starting to see baseball get a little bit more proactive when it comes to things like that. So hopefully, you know, baseball will also follow suit. Yeah, I mean, he, Donald Trump is so divisive. So I, I across many lines, racial lines, um, gender lines. So I just can't, I just personally can't see any team with, um, that are heavy minorities, women teams, or non-minorities who support the rights of others wanting to be associated with a visit to the White House as long as Donald Trump is there. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Mike, the U.S. Open is now behind us, but we are still feeling the effects of what happened during the final match between Serena Williams and Naomi Osaka. Now, Serena Williams was assessed some penalty points in the waning moments of her match against Osaka. And, um, you know, it, what happened led to discussions of possible sexism and genderism, racism, and it's kind of given tennis a little bit of a black eye. Mike, what did you think about what happened during those moments of the match, and what do you think the Tennis Association can do to rebound from this situation? Well, I think as far as Serena, Serena Williams is concerned, you know, there's, without a doubt, this is something, sexism, racism, this is something that she's had to deal with her whole life, right? And not to mention, um, this is something that she's had all this built up, bottled up frustration that she just had to let out. I think with the judge who, he completely lost control of the game. He, there's no question that the guy shouldn't have done what he did. At the same time, I don't know if he was necessarily throwing this out there and, and giving her these violations because it was sexist, or if it was retribution for some of the tantrums that she's shown in the past, right? In the U.S. Open, if you look at her history, there's been at least two or three instances prior to this where Serena has completely lost her cool. And I think that some of the referees are just completely fed up with it. Not necessarily male referees, both men and women. I thought that there was, um, Serena's response to it, at first, I was completely taken aback. I thought it was completely uncalled for. And I thought that she completely stole this kid's thunder um, by taking the spotlight away from her. I do commend Serena Williams. All right, she is, you know, she's con she's fighting for women's rights. She's doing all these things. I don't necessarily with agree with the way that she reacted that's on Saturday night, you know, at the US Open. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's it's hard for someone to relate to what Serena has been going through throughout her whole career. And I don't think that again that this is necessarily something that just happened with this one instance where Serena was so angry at this one particular referee. I think that this was something that was just she had to get out of her system because she's sick and tired of having to deal with a lot of the stuff that she's had to deal with. But I think that she could have gone about it in a much different way. Yeah, this was um a lot <laughs> to digest at once because you do have a little bit of a meltdown, you have some sexism, and then you have poor judgment all mixed up into one. Okay, so um, I do think that Serena de deserved a penalty for slamming the racket. Like, you just can't do that, and that's across the board. But um, I think this judge chose had poor judgment in terms of when he decided to assess these penalties this is the finals match of the u.s open on the women's side this is serena versus naomi osaka an up-and-coming tennis pro um looking to you know get the top spot looking to defeat serena williams this was her dream her goal and he picked the wrong moment to chastise her to call a violation on coaching which can be up to interpretation because while the coach said yes I was coaching her there's no 
guarantee that Serena even saw the the signals that the the coaches were giving to her and coaching is something that is widely known as being done throughout tennis matches on the women's side and the men's side so why would you take that moment to do that and then just to you know not effectively diffuse like he obviously saw that Serena was upset and to to not try to diffuse the situation but kind of pour a little gasoline on the fire it was ridiculous so it he helped ruin the night for Naomi as well. And um, like I think like you at first, when I saw the clips of her saying, you know, th- if I was a man, you wouldn't do this. I was like, well, wait a minute. But then as I digested, I was like, you know what? She's got a point. I remember the days of John McEnroe and I remember his histrionics. I mean, he was out of control. He would curse that arm, he would slam that racket, and what happened? That became his brand. He was the bad boy of tennis. I think he had a whole marketing campaign endorsement based on this bad boy image. And I remember Andre Agassi, although he wasn't the, um, the, had the same demonstrative demeanor as John Macro, but I remember Andre Agassi had the, the, what is that, the mullet, kind of hair spiky hair he had the earrings and he was edgy he didn't look like the other tennis players but that was his thing that was his brand and you have serena who was banned from wearing a cat suit so you can wear these little bitty tennis shorts tennis skirts but you can't wear a cat suit um and then for her she gets a cartoon that to me was offensive where she's you know acting like a baby and what even pushed it over the edge for me in terms of really honing in that this is a a gender issue was the fact that the president of the U.S. Tennis Association, Katrina Adams, defended uh, Serena and did make mention that the male players have berated umpires at, um, at some point and nothing happened. So tennis really needs to re- evaluate what happened and what they're going to do going forward. And I think that in addition to sensitive sensitivity training, I think they should ban this coaching rule. Like, it's ridiculous. I don't know. This is the first sport that I am aware of where a coach cannot give instruction to his player. Well, we move on, Keisha, to the Josh Gordon saga. And there were some rumors here in New York that possibly Josh Gordon would wind up maybe with the New York Giants. But, of course, the New England Patriots swept in on Monday afternoon, and they grabbed Josh Gordon, the wide receiver from the Cleveland Browns. What is your take, Keisha, on Josh Gordon winding up in New England? Well, good for Tom Brady. You know, we've always uh, said that Tom Brady has limited weapons at the wide receiver position, and now he's got a nice shiny toy who still has some football, some good football left in him. And um, I think that, you know, the the tricky part I think for me is that I don't feel that New England or New England doesn't come across as New England Patriots do not come across as a team that's really warm and fuzzy it seems like there's very low tolerance for anything and I don't know I feel as though that may not be the right environment Our photo of the week is a picture of Jason Kidd, the former Nets player and head coach, staring at the crowd when giving his Basketball Hall of Fame speech. Congratulations, Jason. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. We're in a New York state of mind with our New York sports report. Mike, we're going to go to the hardwood of the NBA and talk about our Brooklyn Nets. Now, it seems as though there are rumors going around that the Phoenix Suns are interested in obtaining the services of guard Spencer Dinwiddie before the start of the uh, training camp. Now, Mike, the Nets have made a lot of moves during the offseason. Do you think that the Nets could absorb the loss of a player like Spencer Dinwiddie? I think that they would find a way to do so. But uh, for me, from my standpoint, I'm very opposed to this trade. I think one thing that the Nets want to do, right, you want to have some familiar faces. And this was a guy that the fans started to rally around a little bit last season. He put up some good numbers, I think maybe 10, 11, possibly even 12 points a game, I think, for the Nets last year. And he, and he was healthy. You know, he never really got hurt last season. And I think that with the amount of money that they're paying him, which isn't even, I don't think, a million bucks, I think it's pretty cheap, um, I think that the Nets want to hold on to a guy like this. Now, if they can go out and get a great deal uh, for something like, you know, for someone like the Phoenix Suns who want to surround their team with someone like this, um, 
you know, the Nets have to look at their options. But from my standpoint, I'd want to keep Dinwiddie on this team because I think that he was one of the lone bright spots on a team that really struggled last season. Now, they did make improvement from the season before, no question about that. But this guy with some personality, you know, he, he does good interviews. And I know that that's not about winning basketball games. But I think with the Nets, you want to have fans that are attract. you know, you want to attract fans by bringing someone in there who they're used to, who they know, and a guy that can shoot. Yeah. You take the words right out of my mouth. Um, you want butts in your seats, okay? You want your arenas full, and you prefer that they be full with your hometown fans. So Spencer Dinwiddie, like you said, was one of the brightest stars uh, for the Brooklyn Nets last season, and people were excited to see him. He got the crowd going, and I don't think you want to lose that. And he is the centerpiece so far, uh, one of the longer-tenured uh, players on the Nets, and I think that you want to keep them him around um, because you have new players coming in, and you you want somebody who's familiar with the organization, familiar with the coach that can guide the new players to help um, create this unity and cohesiveness. Um, and unless you know Phoenix Suns want to give up Devin Booker or DeAndre Ayton, <laughs> then I think you keep um, Spencer, and I um. I, and I, I don't think, you know, the Nets are in a building mode, a rebuilding mode, so to speak. And I'm, I'm not a firm believer of always just blowing up the entire team. I feel as though that you can, you know, gradually do change. You can keep some players and then while releasing others. And then maybe if somewhere down the road it, it, you want to get rid of someone like Spencer, well, chances are you've, you know, kind of created this momentum and gotten other pieces in place so you can still keep moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, uh, Keisha, quick base baseball update. Since we've done our show from the, la from the last time, the New York Yankees, the bad news is that they have really been slipping in the standings. The division is lost. The Boston Red Sox lead them by over 10 games at this point. But the thing for the Yankees, which is good news now, is that Aaron Judge will be back in the lineup. And, of course, closer Araldis Chapman looks like he's just around the corner. So... Hopefully the Yankees can get things going with the last couple of weeks or really 10 days or so in, left in the baseball season. They're trying to get on to that, hold on to that wild card spot. But at the moment of this taping, they only lead the Oakland Athletics by one and a half games. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the course of the next couple of weeks as the Yankees try to get into the playoffs. All rise. <laughs> the judge is back in court, right? Exactly. So this is a this is really important stretch because I've been, you know, reading and, and hearing people talk about the Yankees and this wild card spot and what happens if they lose and or they lose the advantage. They have to go to California right. and then within 24 hours come back and play the Red Sox. Exactly. Right? I got it right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And now it's time we go off topic. LeBron James is at it again, making big moves off the court. According to Variety's Joe Otterson, superstar LeBron James, an L.A. Laker now, and actress Elizabeth Banks are teaming up to produce a new drama series titled Hoops. Well, Mike, it's about that time where we have to say goodbye to our friends, but don't worry. You can keep up with What's the 401 Sports by following us on Twitter and Instagram, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 401 Sports TV. Also, be sure to download and subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, Spotify, and Stitcher. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us here at What's the 401 Sports, and we definitely look forward to seeing you again. 